Greetings everyone, welcome to our section on tension elements and I'm going to be giving you an overview of the design of members for tension and this uh, lecture is going to give you some of the sort of components that can be covering but there are quite a number of additional videos that go along with this one that will fill in the gaps and explains various concepts and complete worked examples and similar things. So getting into it we're going to look at how do steel elements fail, where and how are tension elements used, material behavior, tension calculations, net area, block shear, welder connections, slenderness limits. All of these things are covered in the suite of um, tension element videos created, so not necessarily in this one. This is a brief introduction. So consider now, for instance, this member, and we will do this as a worked example. How would these truss elements fail in tension? So just think about something where you, for instance, have progressive load being applied to the roof. Um, it could either be downwards from the weight of the roof, the sheeting, uh, maintenance, ducting hang hanging from the roof, uh, facilities, all sorts of things. At the same time, it also could be an upward load. You could have a wind load being applied and then sucking the wind up, I mean, sucking the roof upwards by creating a, an upward draft. So, <clears throat> We any of those members could have either a tension or compression um, in them. And just think about now as you look at that member, for instance, either if the green, the blue, or the orange member in the middle of the screen here were in tension, how would they fail? If you were pulling on them, what would effectively break? We're only going to cover the, the member components um, but in future sections of this course, we're also going to look at bolts, um, for instance, welded gusset plates and the like. So you'll ultimately be able to design this entire unit and uh, yeah, be able to specify that for a building. Now, firstly, where and how are tension elements used? And they're used in all sorts of different places. For instance, you've got truss elements for um, some load combination, because as I mentioned, depending on the, whether the load is up or down, it may alternate between tension and compression, so you design for both of those. We've got roof bracing. This is quite commonly done to try stabilize buildings. For instance, if I have a force being applied to the end of my building, I will then have this um, brace structure that then supports it. It's sort of a rigid diaphragm that helps support it. And what happens, these members are long and thin, so they only take compression, I mean, tension, they are, they are tension only members. And so you end up with a sort of a, a braced roof bay and then side bracing, vertical bracing, and this provides stiffness and uh, load carrying stability for anything applied from the side of the building. And we will learn later about does how to design that. But they're long slender members. So break. Tension elements are very effective. They're very efficient in terms of load carrying capacity. You also can have knee braces. Now this is a knee brace there or there. And I know a lot of people make mistakes with knee braces, just not knowing what on earth they are. If you've got a truss, for instance, at the bottom of the screen, this could be a very long span from there to there. And if, for instance, the bottom cord went into tension, it could buckle sideways. So at specific points, you may want to stabilize it and prevent it from buckling sideways. So in into or out of the page or into or away out of your computer screen. And so you want to prevent movement in that direction. So you anchor the the, the the bottom cord of the truss up onto the purlins above. So the purlins are those members there. They support sheeting. And you've got this giant Meccano set you're trying to put together to make as efficient as possible. So you put these lightweight diagonals onto your cord, to, onto the bottom cord of your truss, and then they help stabilize it. So in this case, you may have to have something like that at 45 degrees into or out of the plane to help stabilize it. So uh, you can make a tension element out of pretty much anything. Often it's done with um, angles. Uh, you can have T profiles, channels, H, etc. And they all have their different guidelines in terms of design. So when it comes to members in uh, to tension in members, we we'll introduced in the very first lecture that the real stress strain behavior of steel looks something like that. Where I've just drawn this above, but this would be your yield strength there. Um, 
we in fact most of the time we simplify our behavior to this um, bilinear linear elastic then perfectly plastic behavior that occurs and when you have tension just as a, as a note in terms of material tension stabilizes compression destabilizes. Tension elements are not subject to buckling. And that's quite important. That's why also they are the easiest ones to design. You'll see when we get on to compression and bending, it's a lot more complicated because members buckle. And this is easy to picture because if you take a string and you pull on a piece of string, it becomes quite stable. And you know, not much happens to it after that. It'll it'll hold its place and it almost feels much stiffer and stronger when you pull on it. Whereas if you push on string, it just sort of folds out the way and then doesn't do much. And so tension stabilizes and you don't then have to worry about much. It's a much simpler design process. When we design, however, we assume that we have this yield strength or you'll see later also how we can assume we have an ultimate strength locally in a small area but in reality what happens when they make a section it cools down so uh, in the first lecture i showed you how you you will hot roll a section so a bunch of hot steel plates will form together and for instance this piece here because it's connected together will take longer to cool down and so what happens is, is the other um, pieces cool, fa cool faster and then they contract more and they end up inducing stresses in each other. So you actually have residual stresses in the section. So before you put any load on it, even if you just pick up a piece of steel, there's nothing um, loaded onto it, it will have stresses built into it. And these can be as much as 50% of the yield strength. And then such stresses do influence the way loads are carried. But thankfully they don't introduce our, I mean, don't influence our stiffness. So as I was saying, you can have 50% of, of load. These are hypothetical, what I've got shown here, but give or take, it gives you an idea that these are fairly, can be fairly large stresses that have been induced. So the total, total tension force carried by a member, even if um, bending is, is present, is the integration of the stresses in the section. So if you integrate the, um, the stress times the area, you integrate it, you'll get a tension force. And if it's a uniform stress, then you'll find tension is just stress times area. So normally we have a rectangular tension, well, stress block, which is easy. So we just have stress times area. As I was saying earlier, you, if you integrate, you'll find that as well. For instance, here, if you've got a perfect um, pure bending, what you find is you integrate and you get to zero. When there's pure bending, there's no tension force. So the bottom triangle actually cancels out the top triangle when you, you add it all up. Now, because of the presence of residual stresses over section, the internal stresses will not be perfectly uniform. However, residual stresses will be in balance. So if you integrate these residual stresses here, if you integrate all these different areas, you'll find that they balance. They, they have to, otherwise you don't have static equilibrium. Otherwise your cross-section will be accelerating down the road. Now, tension, tensile capacity is not influenced by the presence of residual stresses because any area which is more highly stressed will simply yield first and then the remaining sections yield, with the remaining sections yielding after that. But ultimately, the entire section will reach yield. The load elongation curve is slightly um, adjusted relative to the bilinear relationship. So, for instance, <clears throat> what we would have is, let's say we've got a rectangular cross-section here and we put a tension force on it and initially it's got residual stresses that look like are shown here and what we would actually find if we plotted them on this diagram for instance one is in tension and one is in compression if we just take these two areas and so <coughs> what we're going to do now is load this section up so for instance, the part that is now at 60%, oh, let me actually draw that a little bit higher up. Let's say now this is at 60%. We now add on an extra 40% of yield stress all the way along. So we add on a uniform tension force. We will now move this point from there to there. We take it up to yield, and this one was at minus um, 30% and is now at 10% stressed. 
So this region here is now fully stressed. It has now reached yield. The bottom part is only a 10% yield. So you think, oh, oh, this thing is going to fail now. If this was glass or a brittle material um, such as concrete, it would fail now. Um, concrete when there's no rebar in it. Because as soon as you exceed your, your limit of stress, it cracks and it fails. But the good thing is steel is ductile. So even when things aren't quite perfectly what we think, we're still okay. Because now what happens, we are going to continue to load this. But instead of the stress here continuing to go up, it doesn't carry any more load. It just gets longer. So all that happens, it just moves further down this path. So initially we're there, we loaded it up to yield, and then it moved further down, down the line. And so the other one, we loaded up to you know, 10%, and then we continue, and then we load and load and load, and eventually it hits yield as well, and now the entire cross-section has yielded. But if you add up what we applied we end up with a full tension load, as if the residual stresses were not there. So that is simply because the elastic, well, the, the, the plastic behavior of steel, that it's a ductile material, we don't have to worry about residual stresses normally. It does change our load elongation relationship. We don't actually get this perfect bilinear relationship. We actually, what happens if you plot load on the one axis versus elongation on the other, um, we end up, I, I, when I was plotting these points, I was referring to them as stresses. Um, but for instance, if we have our load elongation, we actually get something like this, this curved line when we incorporate all those points together. And so it, it stops being as we, we have shown it here. So that gives you an overview of how we can consider residual stresses, but it's not as big a deal if as we think. So now, continuing on, refer to the other video which covers all the specific guidelines in SANS 10162 Part 1. So this has various guidelines for uh, you know how to understand the code and interpret the code and what the different clauses mean. And now also refer to the other video referred to, uh, to in the course discussing shear lag and bolted connections. But the main thing with shear lag, we need a distance for load to spread out and we have some amount, when it fails, some amount of area that is ineffective. Well, on the failure plane each time, some amount of material is lost. Um, as I was saying, so if, when it fails here, we lose some material. So, last thing, slenderness. Now, this is briefly covered in uh, the, the SANS 10162 video, but the maximum slenderness of tension elements is limited to 300 to prevent vibration, ensure members are not too slender during erection, and other such factors. And to be honest, they just kind of look stupid when they exceed the slenderness on site. They, they, you know, just something just look, doesn't look quite look right with them. Always check slenderness when designing members. Also, sections more slenderness usually look stupid on site, as I, as I said. However, this limit can be set aside as in the case when cables are used. Using the slenderness limit is a useful way of initially sizing an element, e.g. a 4 meter long in angle in tension will need a minimum radius of gyration of L over 300, you just um, mix this equation around and you make R min the, the subject, and we know we need a radius of gyration of greater than 13.3 mils, thus a 7076 angle would be suitable. You just run your um, I down the column and you find one that is is greater than that and you'll see with an angle you actually have four R values Rx, Ry, Ru and Rv they are four axes and we will discuss those more when we come to compression elements and, and how we do it. Um, if the bracing was part of a cross brace connected mid span then Ry could be used. So uh, let's have a look now at that, that cross brace and I have the axis convention shown here. So this was part of a big braced bay structure where uh, it was a multi-story building and this was stabilizing the, the structure. So now we're having a look at this member here. Now just imagine that we walked up to this diagonal member and we started pushing on it or pulling on it. If we pulled it down directly downward, so down like that. Just think about what would happen. Well, if you went and hang on, hung on it, not a lot would happen because what would do is that 
as you try to go down, there would be a component there providing a reaction and a component there. So it would be stabilized. So you'd, you'd have a sum of forces that would, would equal out and you would have virtually no movement. Same thing if you wanted to do an upward um, force, a let, you would then have your diet some sort of stabilization. It can't go anywhere. Same thing, even if I walked up to this and I tried to move it to the left or the right. Once again, these angles here would stabilize it. I can't move it up or down, left or right, because for me to do that, I would actually have to elongate those green angles. But now think about what would happen is if I pushed it into the page. If I walked up to it, and by all means, go do this. Next time you see a cross brace in a building go up, um, push it, and you'll see how flexible this is. If, for instance, I push it now into or out of the page, like that, so you'd find there's virtually no stiffness. You have basically a simply supported member from there to there. Um, supporting it. Let me draw that in another color so you can see it. Um, so you have a simply supported member basically from one side to another and there's an, it, the stiffness of an angle is very very low. The bending stiffness, the IX or the IY, um, depending on which axis you're bending, is very low. So it is not going to be restrained. So it will deflect all the way like that from start to finish. So let's start plotting those and see what would be your effective length between where and where is this angle anchored. And so it depends on what axis we are looking at. So I was just discussing the y-axis and for the y-axis it's only anchored really there and there at sort of the heavy column. So this would be my ly. However, for the other axis, so remember this is buckling about yy, so this is perpendicular, so that is a movement like that. Now, I'm just going to do some colors on here so you can hopefully follow. If, for instance, I have a v movement, that is diagonal, or a u movement, those are diagonal, and once again, that for it to move diagonally up or diagonally down, so it would buckling about V would be like that, a buckling about U would be like that, it would have to move diagonally along that path. And it can't move up, it can't move down, it can only move left or right. So my effective length then becomes L, U, L, V. And then the same thing for L, X, we have, for instance, if I now, uh, if I move it up or down, then we will have an L, Y here. It is the same. I'm just going to draw that again because I'm not sure if you can actually see that on your screen. So there's your L, Y. Um, so that would give you your L, U, L, V, L, Y, so, and then um, it's the same thing, either whether it's the, the bottom half or the top half, it's the same thing there and there, just to, to make a note. Where's your L, Y? It's much, apologies, I have just mislabeled this. Um, this is an L, X. And so between there and there, it is anchored for U, V, and X, where over the full distance we have our L, Y. For this angle, you can see that the angle tries to buckle about the V, V axis that is moved diagonally up or down. However, it is restrained by the other cross brace from moving up or down, meaning that it can only move from side to side, i.e. it can only buckle over the Y axis over its full length. All right, with that, um, slenderness is normally, normally not covered in depth in, in tension elements, but I've just added it here because of the, the importance of understanding slenderness and buckling, because this is going to appear a lot more in the course for bending and compression and all sorts of other sections. So, But with that, that's given an introduction to tension elements. Now follow on with the rest of the videos that explain in code requirements, failure, worked examples, etc. Thank you.